It all started as always. It was an ordinary day at the end of December. I was very concerned about my latest attempt to reach my annual sales goals. So much so that I completely forgot that there were only three days left until Christmas. I looked around the small warehouse where my company was located and noticed several employees who were not working too hard. I hung up and headed towards them. We couldn't sell any auto parts if they were messing around. At this rate, I might have to call them into work the day after Christmas. As I walked towards them, a slender figure with long red curls reaching almost to her butt tried to intercept me. But this time she was late. By the time she placed one graceful hand on my shoulder to calm me, I had already begun my tirade. How are we supposed to achieve our sales goals? If all my salespeople are hanging out in the middle of the warehouse doing nothing, I shouted. But Ev, we were trying to decide that. Began Rob, one of my oldest employees. Rob was my older sister's son, so technically he was my nephew. The strange thing was that my parents remained active in their later years, so my nephew was a year older than me. You worked? I barked. Well, um, no, Uncle Ev, he said dropping his shoulders and looking at his shoes. Well, um, get back to work, or nephew or not, I will fire you all, I shouted. I was starting to get excited when the same little red-haired fury pulled me away from the guys and brought me back to my office. Evan Neiser, she said sharply, what are you trying to achieve? Yelling at these guys will do nothing but further reduce their chances of meeting your sales goals. They are good guys and work hard. Do you know what they did? She looked at me and sat me back in my big, comfortable chair. They were trying to decide what to get you for Christmas. We all raised money. Every person there, whether in sales or production, chipped in. Evan, sometimes you have to take risks. Sometimes you just have to let go and let things take their course. Iris, don't start singing Doris Day songs, I snapped. Quesera Sarah, she sang, as if teasing me. Evan, this year has been hell for the auto parts market. How many of our former competitors went bankrupt this year? Before I could answer, she continued. But you got us through it all. We haven't laid off a single employee, and we're still going strong. In a year like this, I would call it smart business planning and management. But maybe we should keep your sales goal. Evan, it's Christmas. Bah, nonsense, I spat. My ass is nonsense she retorted. Evan Neiser, there's no need to be such a Scrooge. I stared at her, clenching my fists at my sides. She stood there, unflinching, as if she knew something that no one else knew, including me. I sighed heavily and returned to my office. After me, she herded the vendors back to their tables. This little dispute was just the beginning. Shortly before lunch, a real storm began. The front door opened, and the woman, who was only four feet eleven inches tall, made Iris, at five feet two inches, appear tall. She also outweighed Iris by at least a hundred pounds. Her hair was as black as a raven's wing, cut short and curled inwards towards her chin. Her eyes contrasted with her dark hair. They were a beautiful light blue color. Those light blue eyes, combined with very red lips and a completely angelic expression on her face, gave her such beauty that men did not notice anything else. She was wrapped in a very lush, very expensive fur coat that deceived the eye. Because of the volume of her coat, everyone thought she was much thinner than she actually was. I knew from experience that under that coat, she was as round as she appeared in it. Although she was short, she could not be called petite. Under this coat were hidden two breasts that were larger than her head. Unlike many big girls, she also had a very nice round butt. Her soft and quivering belly might turn some guys off, but I loved it. Ev, you should have stopped by and bought donuts for the kids to take to school, she said angrily, and my schedule has changed. I won't be able to pick them up this afternoon, so you'll have to do it. I also need one of your credit cards. Mine is at its limit again. She stood before me as if she had been born a queen or at least elected president. There were several things I wanted to say but didn't. As usual, I simply took my card out of my wallet and gave it to her. I was overcome with anger. But I fell silent almost immediately. I swallowed my words and didn't like them. 
did you want to say something? She asked. The beauty of her face was distorted with anger. What did you want to say? I know you're not going to tell me anything about me having a life or a few friends. Why can you go out almost every day, but I have to stay at home? Even your kids can go out and go to school with their fucking greedy friends. Her round figure almost vibrated with anger. I tried to calm her down, but it didn't work. I didn't say anything, I muttered. Fuck you, Evan Neiser, she screamed at the top of her impressive lungs. No, I take it back. The next time I have sex with you, Obama will be president. Obama is already president, Carol, I said, trying to salvage some remaining self-respect. Our argument became so loud that everyone in the office could hear us, or at least her. I'm talking about Sasha Obama, she said contemptuously. You treat me like a slave. All I do is give birth to you children and take care of the house. Should I be your housekeeper and sex slave? I deserve to live, Evan. Fuck you, I want a divorce. This was her trump card. Every time we had a big fight, she always threatened me with divorce. The problem was that I loved her fat ass. I loved her so much that I couldn't imagine life without her. I also couldn't bear being separated from my children. Calm down, Carol, I said. Go and do your own thing with your friends. I'll pick up the children. And come in and buy them something for dinner so I don't have to cook, she said, turning to the door and putting on expensive designer sunglasses. As Carol left the building, I noticed some of the salespeople covering their faces or lowering their heads to hide their laughter at me. I even heard a few chuckles from the back of the room, which some of the braver ones didn't bother to hide. One of them, Greg Jenkins, didn't even try to hide the contempt in his voice. He can't boss this fat bitch around at home, so he takes it out on us here, he said. I looked back at the office and heard a crash, and then the sound of water. I saw Iris. Her face contorted with anger as she clutched the broken plastic glass of water. She broke the glass in her tiny hand and water spilled all over the table. I've always heard that redheads can be hot-tempered, but in the five years I've known Iris, this is the first time I've seen her lose her temper. She stormed into my office and slammed the door behind her before exploding. That fat bitch is not going to divorce you. She's too smart for that. She knows that no one in the world will want to see her. I'm tired of her treating you like. She paused and looked at me. Sorry, Evan, she said calmly. I just lost consciousness for a moment. This won't happen again. Please don't fire me. I love my job. Iris, I would never fire you for any reason, I said. Is this what you mean? She asked, smiling. I simply nodded. Iris, I need to get out of here for a while, I said. I need to calm down. If I'm not back by 2.30, could you pick up my kids? I, she asked, smiling again. Of course I love your children. She acted as if taking my children was some kind of honor and not just another task. I gently grabbed her shoulder, then grabbed her keys and headed for the door. On my way out, I avoided eye contact with the men in the office. Leaving the office, I walked through the workshop and several production areas. Several of my longtime co-workers waved to me. I waved back out of habit, trying to hide my anger until I was out of the building. I calmly walked to my Jeep Grand Cherokee and opened the door. I started the engine and turned up the volume on the stereo. My regular sports radio wasn't what I needed to listen to. Mike Valen's smug tone didn't help calm me down. I switched to my music collection and selected a soothing Gordon Lightfoot song. When I pulled out of the parking lot and just drove, I had no destination in mind. I just needed to get away from people. I was driving north on I-75 when I noticed a nearly blinding flash behind me. I recognized the front clip and the design on the headlight, the same way most people recognize one of their children. It was a Mustang GT, and it went damn fast. Whoever the driver was, he had more courage than me. Not only had my own Mustang been put away for the winter for over a month, I never dreamed of driving it that fast on icy roads. I suspected that much sooner rather than later the guy would end up running off the road and into a ditch. The pony car had too much power to do much more than just spin the rear wheels and slide around in this mess. That's why I drove my Jeep in winter. Traction control can do a lot. 
The guy flew past me as if I was standing still. I didn't look at him as he rushed past me. He was walking too fast. Besides, I had to keep my eyes on the road. Even with four-wheel drive, Michigan roads can be dangerous in the winter. Black ice lurks beneath every inch of hard-packed snow, and before you know it, you could be losing control in the middle of traffic. It seems like every idiot on the road thinks he controls a car like Jimmy Johnson when no one else can drive a damn thing. My prediction came true as if I were a psychic. The idiot driving that beautiful yellow fish Mustang's tail swung wildly as the overloaded rear wheels began to spin in the snowy mud. Adrenaline overflowed my body as I tried to react quickly enough to escape. I jerked the steering wheel to the side to avoid crashing into the rapidly spinning pony car, and I flew off the road. There was a flashing light as if my head had hit something, but I don't remember the airbag going off. Crap, I thought. Leave it to Chrysler to ruin the only good car they make. Now even Jeeps were unreliable. I couldn't believe my airbag had failed. Carol. From time to time, men need to be put in their place. My mini-argument with my husband went as well as possible. It was all planned. I've heard that the best defense is a good offense. My dad told me this all the time, so if I wanted to go out and do something and didn't want to worry about Ev calling home and asking where I was, the best thing to do was just tell him I was leaving. And after getting upset about it and starting an argument, Ev just left me alone and never bothered me about it or brought it up again. Of course, I lied to him about where I was going and what I was going to do, but he didn't need to know that. I got back into my car and drove out of Eva's warehouse. I took my phone out of my purse and called a familiar number. I actually knew the number by heart. I didn't save it to my phone's memory in case Ev ever checked my phone. I'll be there soon, I said. Then I hung up. Twenty minutes later I got out of the car and entered one of the largest hotels on the riverbank. I didn't need to check the room number. I pulled out my cell phone again and checked the message I had received about an hour ago. I went up to room 2112. I took the elevator to the 21st floor of a high-rise hotel. I looked back at the other people in the elevator and smiled at a couple of guys who were looking at me. When I got off the elevator, I knew the way to the room. I've been here many times before. I knocked on the door, and it opened almost immediately. A man who, at thirty, was more than ten years younger than me, opened it and pulled me inside. We made love. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't, even at this time, get Evan out of my mind. I hated Evan as much as I loved him. As a child, I was always in my brother's shadow. Phil was smart. Phil was handsome. My parents always talked about Phil growing up to do great things. I was just a little fat girl in his shadow. When I became a teenager, my smart and brilliant brother entered the military academy. He did not want to go to war, and fortunately, it was peacetime. But the academy offered an education that could rival all the best universities in the country. They also offered an alumni network that reached through most of the largest corporations and most powerful industries around the world. Graduating from the military academy would guarantee my brother's future. Unfortunately, an unforeseen circumstance robbed the world and my parents of the person Phil could have become. He died during a peacetime exercise. Phil was taking a self-defense class when he was hit. It wasn't a very hard blow. This shouldn't have happened. Accident. He died immediately. The bright star of my parents' universe went out like a candle in the wind. They never recovered. The fact that they had a daughter who still needed them somehow couldn't cut through their sadness. I grew up in a house with three people that had nothing in common with the house where the family once lived. I'm not even sure my parents ever knew or cared about the hell I went through as a child. I've always been the heavier girl. But my breasts appeared very early and never seemed to stop growing. Children, especially in their teens, considered me more of an object of ridicule than someone they would consider dating. I've also been the butt of every fat joke known to man. After school, I had several dead-end jobs. I didn't actually have sex until I was 22. I don't think he even knew what my face looked like. All he cared about were my breasts. I endured this existence, continuing to live in my parents' house. By the age of 24, 
I had not yet been in any relationship. I had sex a few times, and I didn't think there was anything special about sex. Most men who wanted me just wanted my breasts. Then Evan showed up. He just started his business. He only had one or two employees and rented space in the back of someone else's store. But his look told me that he would do great things. I worked as a waitress at a greasy spoon near where he rented space. The first time he came here it was only because the restaurant where he usually dined was full. After that he kept coming back. I was sure it wasn't the food. I also knew that he liked me. I decided early on that, although he was younger and less creepy than the guys I was used to, he was most attracted to my breasts. He didn't seem to be in a hurry though. Then he seemed to gather his courage. I knew his next move would be to ask if he could take me home. Once he put me in the car, he assessed me and then headed towards the promised land or the promised mountains. Imagine my surprise when he asked me out on a date instead. Where were you going to take me? I asked. I didn't want him to know that it was my first date. I thought it would be something like a cinema. This way he could sense me in the dark. I know a really great restaurant on the east side, close to the river, he said. But if you want to go somewhere else. Shock is not a strong enough word. Then I noticed it. The first four buttons of my blouse were undone. I had more cleavage than a star, and he looked into my eyes. Evan, I'll go wherever you want, any time you want, I said. From that moment on I was Evan's property, and he took very good care of me. I fell in love with the way even made me feel. Many other guys looked at me and saw a fat girl with huge breasts. Some of them didn't give me enough attention. Some of them had just seen a pair of tits walking. I wasn't sure they even knew I was related to them. But even saw me. He often told me how beautiful I was, and then we didn't even have sex. I started to feel a little apprehensive about what would happen if we had sex. Will he still think I'm beautiful? Or he'll see that I'm just another fat girl and stop loving me? It was like a banned substance to me. When it finally happened, it was a life-changing event. I didn't think things between us could ever get better. In my opinion, the ideal evening involved Evan picking me up after work, taking me to his apartment, and having sex. Evan, of course, had other ideas. He continued to take me to shows, restaurants, outings, and other events. He wasn't ashamed of me. He seemed proud of me. Then he threw my whole world into turmoil. One evening, Evan took me to his house. He sat me down, but I had no idea what was about to happen. He knelt down and I closed my eyes in anticipation of the pleasure to come. I waited a few seconds, thinking he was teasing me. When after a few moments nothing happened, I opened one eye and went into shock. Evan was on one knee in front of me and held out the most beautiful ring I had ever seen. I was in a daze. Carol, are you going to give me an answer, or do you need time to think? He asked. In an instant, my life changed. Until that evening, I kept Evan a secret. Only the women I worked with knew about him. None of my family or friends knew anything about him outside of work. That way, if something went wrong, no one would be able to laugh at me or look down on me. What I hated most was the way the poor fat girl looked. That evening, I took Evan home and introduced him to his parents. The next morning, I started moving my things into Evan's apartment. I was happier than I had ever been in my life. Another benefit that I never expected was that my parents were suddenly interested in me. They have never existed before. I felt like I was surrounded by love for the first time in my life. After we got married, we visited my parents often. When my children were born, we became even closer. It took me Christmas to notice the nightmare I was living. My parents gave Evan very expensive fishing equipment. My father also took Evan fishing in the Florida Keys. There were also plenty of toys for the kids. They gave me things for the children. They didn't give me a single personal gift. Then I realized that my parents don't care about me. I was surprised they even knew my fucking name. Their only interest in me was that I brought them Evan. Evan was a kind of replacement for my brother in their hearts. They also loved their grandchildren. And I was only there to take care of Evan and the kids. My own parents ignored me at every turn. It took some time, but over time I began to hate my parents. 
I also began to somewhat recently Evan, and even my children. I wondered what the hell was wrong with me. Why couldn't the people who gave me life see me as a special and important person? I don't know exactly when I decided to punish Evan, but I've been letting Billy have sex with me for the past year. I see Billy at least a couple times a week, and every time I feel like I'm hitting back at Evan and my parents. I guess I'm punishing my parents for never treating me the way they treated my brother, or the way they now treat Evan and my children, and I'm punishing Evan for taking my parents' attention away from me. Billy and I will line up and go to bed. Before leaving the hotel, I left him some money. Billy doesn't have a job, so he needs my help. Giving him money is the least I can do for him. Billy loves me, not my parents, and not my children. Billy is all mine. Evan. I was awakened by a knock on the windshield. There was a guy in my Jeep. My head felt very strange. I looked around and noticed that my Jeep was totaled. I got off the road. I remember thinking, this isn't my damn airbag. I was clearly wrong as the remains of the airbag flew out of my steering column. I looked at the guy knocking on the window and tried to open the door. He opened the door and started talking to me. Are you okay, Evan? He asked. He seemed concerned about my well-being. He probably just didn't want me to sue him for running me off the damn road. I carefully moved my upper limbs and then my lower limbs. I tried to get out of the wrecked jeep and found that I could. In my mind, this meant that I was physically fine. At least I didn't find any serious injuries. You're okay, Evan, he said. For some reason I believed him. Then the anger I was trying to dispel came back. Considering the fact that the bastard crashed my car, my anger was justified. How the hell do you know if I'm okay? I suddenly screamed. Are you a doctor, or do you play one on TV? He looked surprised. There was no fear in him at all. When I looked at him, not knowing exactly what he expected of me, he seemed almost too calm. As I looked at him, the engine of a nearby Mustang idled. Um, Evan, you need to calm down, he said, looking at the yellow Mustang. Who the hell are you? I asked. Can I see your insurance information and ID? I'm Tim Matthews, he smiled. There's nothing wrong with your car. You don't need to involve insurance agencies. Oh, crap, I said. You don't have any fucking insurance, do you? We don't need no stinking insurance, he laughed. There's nothing wrong with your car. Let's start. He gently grabbed my hand and led me to his Mustang. As we approached, the car, experiencing an almost eerie atmosphere that was more reminiscent of Halloween than Christmas, started the engine again. A little snow began to fall, but, strangely enough, not a single snow fell on the car. Every shiny body panel seemed dry and untouched by moisture and snow. It seemed strange to me that the car was dry and shiny while snow was falling around us. I looked at the driver again. Uh, Tim, where are we going? I asked. I'm doing a favor for a friend, he said. I have something to show you. Come on, we don't have much time. Chrissy won't hurt you. For some reason, I just didn't want to argue. He really seemed trustworthy. His car scared me. Nevertheless, I got into the car. I sank into the rich, thick skin. Tim, maybe you should slow down a little, I said. He just laughed. He released the parking brake and gave the engine some gas. The car rushed forward faster than I had ever felt. Even on snowy and slushy roads, the tires seemed to bite and propel the car forward with the confidence of a mountain goat. I looked at the speedometer and noticed that we were passing cars as if they were standing still. A hundred miles an hour in the sleet seemed stupid. One hundred and fifty assured me that we would not survive this trip. As we sped along at two hundred miles an hour, with little movement outside the windows, Tim casually reached out and turned on the stereo. The song sounded very cheerful, the ringing of bells and the conversation of an old man. When they got to the chorus of the song, I realized Tim was crazy. The song was called, You're Gonna Get Nothing for Christmas, and Tom laughed maniacally every time the chorus came on. As soon as the song ended, Tim stopped the car, and we got out. I recognized this place. It was my old apartment building. I lived here, I said. Tim simply smiled and said, yes. I followed him into the building, 
thinking that perhaps we had come here to call the police and report the incident. He grabbed my hand, and we walked straight through the wall. It was truly disorienting. It scared me a lot. When I came to my senses and my mind began to function at a level close to normal, I noticed that we had entered the apartment. We looked at the two people on the couch. A woman was lying with a man on the sofa. They watched TV, and she snuggled up to him. She looked familiar, but her hair confused me. Then I remembered. For the past five years, Carol has kept her hair short. I looked at myself, how I made love to my wife before we got married. Damn, what huge breasts, Tim shouted. This is my wife, you bastard. Hey, wait a minute. How the hell do you do that? What are we doing here? I asked. My friend wanted you to see this, he said calmly. Who is your friend, and why does he want us to watch me make love to my wife? I asked. My friend calls himself the ghost of Christmas past, Tim said, and I think you should understand something by looking at this. Stop staring at my wife's breasts, I barked. Wait, did you say the ghost of Christmas past? Yes, he said. Relax, they can neither see nor hear us, so she will never know that I saw her breasts. Yes, but I will know, and that's my wife you're staring at, I said. God, she was beautiful back then. Looking at her face, I saw nothing but love in her eyes. This was before she became such a spoiled bitch. I wondered what had changed. Was it because of me? Did I do something to cause such a drastic change in her behavior? It's not because of you, buddy, Tim said, as if he was reading my thoughts. Quick test. What do we see? What do you mean? I asked. Come on, Evan. Use your head. These are two mad lovers, right? He just looked at me. Nod if you're still with me. I nodded my head, and he shook his as if he didn't believe me. Chrissy, he shouted, and suddenly we were outside, standing in front of his yellow Mustang. We got into the car, and before I could fasten my seatbelt, he was already driving. Trees, houses, people and cars rushed past the window with stunning speed. We drove past the police car so fast that I doubt the officers even saw us. The strangest thing about it was that for a while along the way the temperature rose and the sun came out. Then, as I watched, the leaves on the trees changed color, and suddenly it was winter again. We parked in my driveway, but the house looked different. The fence we put up a few years ago is gone, and looking at the backyard, I didn't see a pool or a deck. It was strange. I looked at him to ask a question, but he was already outside the car. Hurry up, man, we're limited on time, he said. I got out of the car and was confused. What the hell are we looking for? He grabbed my hand and walked through the wall. I was ready for his trick this time. We entered a scene that should have happened three or four years ago. My family was together, but the children were probably only five and six years old. Apparently, it was Christmas morning. I started to see something. The first place we visited was also at Christmas. Iris and I just got together. This was our first Christmas together. Then we couldn't tear ourselves away from each other. The scene we were watching now was years later. We had money and we spent it on children. But Carol and I were still madly in love with each other. While watching this scene, I noticed something. I walked up to the stage a few inches from Iris and looked closely at her face. Her face was different. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what the difference was, but there was one. Her face became harder. Perhaps it was because of the passing years or the challenges we faced. I looked at Tim. Well, your head is partially out of your ass, he chuckled. But you still don't see everything. At least you noticed something, so maybe you still have a chance. I went to the kitchen. I looked at the calendar on the refrigerator. It was Christmas 2009, four years ago. Can I have some hint? I asked. Am I looking at Carol or at myself? Evan, think about what you just saw. You think the difference in your wife is all the crap you've been through, right? This is the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard. Your wife doesn't do anything. You are the one who goes out and works. Where is she going to run into trouble? Maybe she had a heart attack between the refrigerator and the couch. What do you have against fat women? I asked. All women are beautiful in their own way. Different men like different types of women. 
We don't all fit into the same box. Well, your wife certainly doesn't fit into most boxes, he chuckled. You liked her breasts enough. So maybe you like fat girls, but you're just ashamed of it. I think you're a secret curvy fan. I think you're secretly an idiot, he said angrily. I have no problems with fat girls. I have a problem with dirty, cheating prostitutes who... He slammed his hand over his mouth as if he had said too much. Are you saying that? I began. He grabbed my hand and walked back through the wall. Tim, since you've already started this, you should. My time is up, buddy, he said. See you. He jumped into the yellow Mustang and started the engine. I stood in front of the car, confident that he would not run into me. He revved the engine several times. I involuntarily retreated. My conviction that he would not run over me was quickly disappearing. I could imagine the headlines in the local newspapers. Businessman and father, shot to death three days before Christmas, left behind. Suddenly I stopped. What would I leave? The car lurched forward and sped down the road almost too fast to see. The car went right through me. See you later, Tim shouted, leaving no doubt that we would meet again. I was standing in the middle of the street in front of my house. But this was my home four years ago. I watched my wife and I leave the house with the kids and get into my old car and drive away. I walked within inches of myself. All sorts of strange thoughts were running through my head. I couldn't help but think of a theory from all the science fiction movies I'd seen that two versions of the same person couldn't exist in the same time and place without destroying the fabric of space-time. Oh God, do you really believe this? Asked a voice behind me. I turned around quickly to see who said it. It was a woman. She took my breath away. She was very small, but very beautiful. She had olive skin and long, thick, wavy black hair that seemed alive. Her dark eyes laughed, but there was pain and sadness in her overall expression. The contrast between these two extremes only enhanced her beauty and the sense of mystery around her. Unlike my wife, this woman was almost flat, but somehow that didn't matter at all. Her full lips and her star-like butt caught my attention. She looked at me, and it seemed like she could read my thoughts too. A couple of years ago, I would have let you, she said sadly. Her voice sounded like cigarettes and too many nights spent doing really dirty things. And once you tried it, you'd be hooked. I would force you to satisfy my desires every time I wanted it, and sometimes even when I didn't want it. But this is precisely what condemned me to the hell in which I am now. I try my best to be the woman I should be. She took a deep breath and paused. Pain appeared in her eyes again. Besides, even if I let you here and now, we would both regret it almost immediately after. I know you would regret it. You're too much like Tim not to regret it, she said. Are you Tim's wife? I asked. Are you the Chrissy he called? Wrong Tim, she said. And Chrissy is not his wife. Chrissy is a machine. My Tim is a different story. Besides, this story is all about you. I think we're all trying to help you as atonement for some of the bad things we've done. Or perhaps, in Tim's case, it was his machine that did the bad things. You know, I'm pretty tired of this, I said. Why does everyone seem to know everything about me? But I don't know anything about you or why any of this is happening. My name is Ivy, she said. I'm a really angry woman. All my life I have had uncontrollable desires. I let them get between me and what I wanted most in life, and now I have to suffer for it. You really look like someone who is suffering, I said sarcastically. Evan, I've been with a lot of men. More than I can count or remember. I had six children with at least five different men, and I lost another child during pregnancy. Through all this, I have only been in love once in my life. I broke this poor man's heart twice, and it could have been even worse. I cheated on him many times, but he only caught me twice. He eventually married my daughter and gave her two children. My daughter died, and now I live with him again to help raise my grandchildren as well as my three youngest children. I know this is my last chance with him, and I swear I will never do this again. I haven't had sex in three years, but he still barely talks to me. I hope that by helping you, I will receive some karmic benefit. So I'm an open book. Ask me anything, she said. 
Why am I here? I asked. It's pretty easy, she said. Someone who loves you made a wish. True love is a very powerful thing. I should know. Just one touch from her enriched, and at the same time destroyed my life. So Carol made a wish for me, I asked. She really didn't have to do that. There's nothing I wouldn't. She put a finger to my lips, silencing me. My lips trembled at her touch. Darling, this train has left, she whispered. Let's not go back. Remember what you have already learned. Yes, Tim blurted out that Carol might be. I began before she interrupted me again. Evan, how did you feel when he said that? She asked. He told you too soon, but did you think he was lying? I just looked at her. Then she took my hand and led me through the wall of the house again. This place is as suitable as any other, she said. She plopped down on the sofa and motioned for me to sit next to her. Who are you? I asked. Why did you die? Because you feel guilty about what you did. She laughed then, and her laughter filled the room. He was musical and made me want her even more. Why me what? She asked. Why did you die? I asked. All these ghosts help me see some aspect of what they want to show me. I assumed Tim died in a car accident. He's driving that car too fast. Um, Evan... Tim and I are still alive. He has a wife and child out there somewhere. He never stops talking about them. I already told you. We simply help for karmic benefits. We both feel bad about certain aspects of our lives. It's the holiday season, Evan. Tim and I are just helping. There are many people who go through hell during the holidays. They need all the help they can get. So you do all this. I began in shock just hoping for a chance to show the person I love that I'm worthy of another chance, she said. So can we move on to your place now? I nodded and sat down next to her. The large TV screen in front of us suddenly turned on. Evan, what you're about to see will probably be painful. But I want you to know that this is good pain. This is cleansing pain. My Tim did it himself once. He went through it all alone. You have me by your side. And Evan, it's going to take a while to get over this. But in the end, you'll be much happier than you ever thought you could be. She took my hand, and we sat on the sofa in front of the TV, which displayed a blank screen. Then an image appeared. And she was right, it hurt. I was looking at the office of my business. I saw the scene that happened just an hour ago. I didn't realize it, but somehow I became a grumpy, stingy old man. I wondered what happened to that man who once swore that any business he ran would always be a fun place to work. Have I really become this person who yells at all my employees? Was money really that important? I had more than enough to live on and my children would never have to suffer. They would always have everything they wanted, so why did we need more? Was it really money that was driving me or something else? I've seen them all. I saw my nephew Bob Cratchit. Hell, in addition to being one of my best employees, Rob was family. I should have made him my assistant manager years ago. And I saw Iris. I always saw Iris. As usual, she tried to calm me down. Iris always tried to relax me and make me have more fun. She was by my side no matter what happened. I need to be a better boss. I need to be a better friend to all of them. They are as important to the success of my company as I am. And then Carol came. She humiliated me in front of my employees. Every year she became more and more spoiled. She spent more and more money, and most of the purchases were so stupid and useless that I even stopped tracking them. I finally looked at the expression on her face when she spoke to me. Now I understood what time was trying to show me. Carol looked at me not with the love that I had seen in her eyes when we were younger, but with hatred or even contempt. I wondered when this happened. I couldn't figure out what I could do to make her treat me this way. I loved her with all my heart. I never cheated on her. I just couldn't understand why she was so angry with me. But it hurt me greatly. I instinctively squeezed Ivy's hand that I was holding. Oh, this will be harder than I thought, she said. Well, you said it would hurt, I said. Yes, but it wasn't the pain I was talking about, she said. She comes further. I wondered how they got this video. How was this recorded? I watched Carol walk into one of the largest hotels in our city. 
she didn't try to hide anything. She stopped at an ATM along the way to withdraw cash from my credit card. She didn't even knock. She simply walked to the door, and it was immediately opened. Some guy I've never seen before. They had sex. The strange thing was that Ivy pointed out one point to me. Carol placed a small frame with a photo of me on the bedside table while they had sex. I couldn't understand why she did this. I was sure that in some way this meant that she still loved me and was forced to do it. Evan, don't be stupid, Ivy said next to me. You're just jealous, I said. You're jealous because I'm ready to forgive Carol and the guy you're living with isn't giving you a second chance. My words touched her deeply and I felt bad when I saw a tear rolling down her cheek. I immediately regretted what I said because, in their own way, all these people were really trying to help me. It's okay, Evan, she said. I know that when you love someone so much, it is very difficult to let go. Perhaps my time never felt the same way about me, so it was easy for him to just leave me twice. I think in our relationship, despite all my shortcomings, I loved him more. I know that no matter what he did, I could never give up. So you continue to love this woman of easy virtue, no matter how much she humiliates you, no matter what she does. You hold on to the hope that someday she will become worthy of what you give her. Well, your boys are already outside, she said, still wiping away tears. I'm sorry I let you down, Evan. But maybe that's how it was meant to be. What kind of boys? I asked. I have only one son, and he is only nine years old. You must be the ghost of Christmas present, right? I turned to her, but she was no longer there. I walked to the door and looked outside. Two young men were walking down the driveway. None of them looked happy to see me. One of them, chubby okay, he was fat. The guy had a lot of Carol's traits. This guy was so fat that it looked like he had her breasts too. He looked really depressed. I'm so sorry for you, Dad, he said. You really tried. The other guy kept looking at the ground. He didn't want to look me in the eyes. Don't pay attention to him said the plump guy. He doesn't want you to see his face. He's usually always happy, but now he's scared to death that you'll see his face and recognize him. He is also afraid that you will make the wrong decision and I will be born in his place. Try not to look at him, okay? Wait, aren't you afraid that I'll make the wrong decision and he will be born? I asked. Hell no, he said. We are actually the same person. You only have one chance. If you hit the wrong target, it will be wasted. Besides, I don't want to live like this. If things go this way, my potential will be wasted. I only see death in my future. The pain becomes too much. Let's get this over with. They positioned themselves so that one was on each side of me, and each grabbed a hand. We took a step as if stepping off a curb, and when the step was completed, there is no other way to explain it, but we were somewhere else where just a few seconds ago we had been standing on an empty suburban street. We suddenly found ourselves on the corner of a busy city avenue in front of a very busy pub. People came and went at breakneck speed. The guys led me inside, and we managed to grab a small booth in the back of the place. Our timing was so precise that it couldn't have been an accident. As soon as the couple left the booth, we immediately occupied it. The plump guy began to actively call the waitress. She met his gaze and nodded. Then she raised one finger. We won't be here long enough to order anything, said the slimmer of the two guys. I know, the plump guy said sharply. I did it so we wouldn't be disturbed. The easiest way to keep the waiter from approaching you is to pretend that you are desperate for service. This works with waitresses too. Then he pointed to the table to our left. It didn't make sense. But the plump guy was sitting at the table hidden from view. This is... I began. Yes, it's me, said the plump guy. But you look terrible, I said. You look like... It's like I'm trying all the illegal substances and everything else to kill myself, he blurted out. You're smarter than you look, Dad. Come on, we have to go, said the slimmer one, as the version of the chubby guy we were looking at stood up and staggered out of the tavern. We followed him. He staggered in his drunkenness right into the traffic and almost caused an accident, but remained unharmed. 
A few blocks later, he practically crawled into the driveway of the same house we had just left. I don't know how many years we moved forward, but the house was no longer well maintained. The guys took my hands again, and as I expected, we walked straight through the wall. Inside, the house seemed even darker and more depressing. The house has been refurbished and has all the modern conveniences possible. There were things there that I didn't recognize. They must have been products of the future. I saw myself again. This time I sat at the table with Carol. Her beauty has disappeared. She had at least three chins. She wasn't much fuller around the waist than she is nowadays, but somehow she didn't wear it as well. Do you want to talk about this before your son comes home? She asked. Carol, you know he's not my son, I said. You're the only father he knows, she sobbed. Don't take it away. He has it. Carol, he is an adult and not stupid. I think he always wondered why he wasn't like his older brother and sister. If anyone deprived him of something, it was you. You sucked all the joy out of our lives, I heard myself say. It was a mistake, she sobbed, and you can't let it go. Why should I? I asked. I'm not as stupid as I was when I was young. I forgave you the first time, and what did that give us? You forgave me, but you never trusted me again, she said. I know you tried, but even what I always counted on, your boundless love, I destroyed even that. It was subtle. You started spending more time at work. It seemed like you were always working. You doubled the number of hours you spent there. And on weekends you were always busy with the children. You three did things without me. Even when I was invited, I did not feel comfortable. It seemed that you pushed me into a second betrayal. Are you trying to blame me for what you did? I shouted. It wasn't me who couldn't keep my legs together. And I forgave you. When you got pregnant, even though our sex life had all but disappeared, I went for it. I did the same things as with other births. I fell in love with you again. I saw this as a sign that it was time to leave the past behind. Carol began to cry. I swear, I thought he was yours, she sobbed. I thought pregnancy would take us back to what we were. I didn't think it would ruin our lives. If I had known this, I would not have given birth to him. So you would cover up your betrayal by killing an innocent child, I asked. He would be better, she cried. We would all be better off. The worst moment of my life was when my twelve-year-old daughter looked at her little brother and said, He's nothing like us. He's more like a cousin than a brother. She said what all the adults were thinking. You did your best, Evan. But you still treated him differently. You bought him the same amount of things and never separated him. But there was just a difference. Hell, I blamed him for not sleeping together after he was born. I'm not even talking about sex. It almost disappeared after the first time. But after he was born, you didn't even sleep in the same room as me. And everything changed. It seemed like you didn't love me anymore, not that you didn't like me. When we were together, I thought that you were created by God especially for me. I know what I look like. I wasn't every girl, but I was yours. The first year we were together, I had to be very careful with what I wore. All it took was a hint of cleavage or a dirty joke and we'd have sex. I missed that. Her voice trembled. Now I can walk around the house almost naked, and all you say is, aren't you cold? I'm sure you have someone, I just don't know who, and don't I deserve this? I asked. Don't I deserve a little happiness too? This conversation will lead nowhere. Raising the past only fuels old wounds. I'm leaving for the weekend, the conversation is over. But Evan, it's Christmas, she wailed. Do you want the children to know that their father went to some prostitute instead of spending Christmas with his family? I think the children won't care, I answered sharply. God knows they're used to it. I remember you sneaked out a few times at Christmas too. Now I wonder why I put up with it. Probably because I loved you so much and never thought you'd go off to cheat with someone on Christmas. What a fool I was. I deserve to be punished, Evan. But they don't. What if children come with their families? She asked. How can I tell them where you are? And I, the other me, stood up then. He walked up to the table and looked deep into the eyes of the woman he once loved. There's no point in lying to you, he said. Carol, the children won't come here. 
We, we will all be celebrating Christmas at our daughter's house. Her eyes filled with sadness and shock. Without me? She asked. Carol, apparently your parents told the kids something before they died last year. Sandy and Junior are really mad at you right now. They need time to come to their senses. Time? You mean, how are you? She asked. My own children hate me so much that they don't want to spend Christmas with me. Apparently they hate me too, said the fat guy, coming around the corner. He looked at both of them, then ran upstairs. Future versions of Carol and I were stunned. A few seconds later, a shot was heard. The two boys grabbed my hands again and stepped back through the walls. Do you see how sad my life is? Said the fat guy. It's only getting worse. I didn't die, but I seriously disfigured myself, but I survived. Can you believe it? I shook my head. I looked at the other boy. Is your life as lousy as his? I asked. Because if so, I don't want to see it. Relax, said the other boy. My life is great. We all love each other. My older brother and sister loved me and spoiled me while I was growing up. You and mom are happier than ever. In fact, the day after Christmas, the two of you leave for your tenth honeymoon. I almost regret that you are not leaving, but I cannot persuade you to stay. Why don't you want us to leave? I asked, still trying to see his face. Because Sandy and Junior have their own lives and families, he said. I am the one who followed in your footsteps, Dad. This is the first time you've left me in charge of the business. I'm not sure I'm ready. You can handle it, I said. I guess you have my business acumen and... Damn, I hope you don't have Carol's ability to spend money. That's impossible, Dad, he laughed. Then he turned away sadly. I turned to the fat guy who seemed even more depressed. What did I say? I asked. Well, you probably already guessed that I'm not your biological son, right? He asked. I nodded. Apparently Carol cheated on me even later in life, and he was a result of that. This made me wonder if I should forgive her. Oh, I said sadly. I felt sorry for the fat guy, but I liked the other one. Although we only exchanged a few words, there was an instant connection between us. I guess I'm not his father either, huh? I asked. Oh, you're his father, the fat guy said, smiling. You are his 100% biological father. He's your copy. So he's like my other two children, I asked. Are his features a combination of mine and Carol's? Well, you guessed half of it, said the fat guy. I think that's why he's so sad. Our time is almost up, and it seems we haven't been able to change your mind. Perhaps I will become one after all. Dad, apparently this decision remains yours. Please follow your heart and make the best decision for yourself. For the first time, be a little selfish. Make the best decision for yourself and everything will be fine. As he spoke, he and the other boy began to disappear, returning to where they came from. As they began to fade, I finally saw the other boy's face. He really looked like me, but he also looked like someone else. It definitely wasn't Carol, however. I wondered what this could mean. Hey, I shouted. How can I get back to where I came from? For a moment there was only silence. Then I heard it. The sound became louder every second. I knew this sound well. It was the sound of a modified 5.0 liter engine boosted by a huge supercharger. Its power was transmitted through an exhaust system that must have been forged in the fires of hell. I quickly jumped onto the sidewalk and took a few steps back. I didn't want to be an easy target. I was sure that this machine hated me. I looked along the road. At first I didn't see anything. Then, like lightning descending from the sky, a yellow Mustang burst into my field of vision. The next moment, Tim was already getting out of the car and looking at his watch, motioning for me to sit down. I got into the car next to him and fastened my seat belt. You know, Evan, Chrissy doesn't hate you. Okay, she doesn't hate you more than anyone else she hates. I think in your case, it has more to do with the fact that she simply doesn't respect you. Um, okay, thanks, I guess, I said. As the familiar distortion of reality set in, I spoke again. Tim, can I do something on the way home? I asked. When would you like to go? He asked with a smile. What about the month before you took me? I said. 
and do you know anyone who? Damn, I don't know how much time has passed. Who can judge the time in such a situation? But I woke up driving my Jeep. There was a sparkle in my eyes, and I was determined. I slammed on the brakes as a blindingly bright yellow Mustang swerved into my lane and sped ahead. This time I avoided the accident and saw Tim waving at me in the rearview mirror. I turned off the highway and drove back to work. As soon as I walked through the door, Iris jumped to her feet. You came back quickly, she said. Are you okay? Iris West, you worry too much about me, I said with a smile. It's my job, she said, blushing. Maybe this is more than a job, I said. Her face turned as red as her hair. Before she could respond, the doors swung open and several men carrying huge stacks of pizza entered the room. Another guy came in and started setting up the DJ booth in the middle of the office. For several minutes, the music played throughout the office. Hey, Greg Jenkins shouted. How should I deal with this noise? Well, Greg, I said, we're having a Christmas party. I'm going to give everyone their Christmas bonuses, and then we'll party like it's 1999. But you won't have to worry about meeting your sales targets anymore, because I made some vital decisions while I was away. You were only gone for a couple of minutes, he snapped. How important could these decisions be? Well, one of them was to make this place a more fun place to work, like it used to be, I said. And another thing was to stop worrying about all this bullshit and just go with your intuition. Another thing was to stop putting up with bullshit from people who don't have my best interests at heart. And see, I heard what you said earlier, Greg. So you're fired. Get lost, buddy. He was stunned. I patted him on the back and wished him a Merry Christmas. Iris and I walked around the office handing out bonus envelopes while the party was in full swing. Everyone in the room was dancing or eating except Greg, who was angrily packing his things. I still hadn't made a decision about Carol, but I had a plan for any outcome. I decided to let her make the decision for me. But anyway, we had to sit down and talk after Christmas. Unfortunately, everything went wrong. Late on Christmas Day, around 11, Carol went upstairs. The children were still opening the last of their presents and deciding what they wanted to play with. I followed Carol to see what she was doing. She dressed as if she was going out. She saw me and started talking in that irritated tone that I started to hate. I need money. I'm going out, she said. It's Christmas, Carol, I said angrily. Your parents are coming, and I won't be gone for more than a couple of hours, she interrupted. You can entertain them. I need to relax with them. I doubt they'll even notice if I'm not there. Under my breath, I muttered, Why can't Billy get along without you just once? What? What did you say? Carol asked. Her face turned pale with shock. I said, Damn, this is stupid. Let's not fight, I said. Go, I'll look after your parents until you get back. I forced myself to smile, but underneath that smile I had already made my decision. In fact, Carol mistook him for me. Carol, I can't believe how nice it was to get out of the house on Christmas Day. It was bad enough that Evan had been indulging the kids all morning. He gave me a lot of really nice gifts, but he still spent more time and energy on the children than on me. Why couldn't it just be the two of us for once like old times? I called my parents and told them we weren't doing anything for Christmas. Apparently Evan called back and told them to come and visit their grandchildren. I knew this would just be another opportunity for me to be ignored and forgotten in favor of Evan and the kids. It's been like this all my life. That's when I decided to go out and spend time with someone who always put me first. I reached the hotel in record time. I felt strange. I felt like something was wrong with me. Evan was starting to get to me. He seemed so hurt when I left. And he gave in so easily. But he always did. The entire time we were together, Evan always tried to give me everything I wanted to make me happy. For a moment, I wondered why I was punishing him because my parents didn't pay attention to me. I also realized that I was transferring my anger and envy towards my brother onto my husband. But these thoughts were fleeting and disappeared as soon as the door opened and Billy pulled me inside. I decided to have fun first and then give in to the guilt. But then there was no later. 
He started telling Billy how sad he was that he couldn't buy his parents Christmas presents. He talked about how one day I would meet his parents and they would love me. I reached into my purse for the money I brought him. The thought sent shivers down my spine. I would like to meet his parents. Perhaps this is what I need. Perhaps a new family is just what the doctor ordered. Maybe I need to start over without my husband and children taking up all the love and attention. But I put that thought aside when I gave Billy the money. Billy was fun and a good way to punish Evan, but he was a toy. He could never replace Evan, and I truly loved my children. Billy snatched the money from my hands as soon as the hotel room door swung open. Three policemen burst into the room and demanded that we raise our hands. Get dressed, fat asses, said one of them. You are under arrest. Why am I being arrested? I screamed. I did not do anything. We've been watching you for weeks, sister. We have everything recorded on video. We walked in just as you were handing him the money. We have every reason to accuse you of providing paid sexual services. I was shocked. They dragged me to the station and Billy was taken in another car. I think they did this to make sure that we wouldn't have a chance to agree on a joint version of events. I was put in a cell with a bunch of dirty, smelly, rude women. I moved to one of the corners of the cell and tried my best not to start crying. I was allowed to make one call. I didn't dare call Evan, so I called one of my friends. Her husband would never let her leave his family for Christmas. I was told that I could make another call the next day. I'll probably be released on bail the next morning, but since it's Christmas, I might be stuck here until the judge shows up. None of the judges were eager to come to work during the holidays. Then the nightmares began. My assigned attorney has already met with the assistant district attorney who will be prosecuting my case. He was tough, trying to make a name for himself. I tried to explain that I didn't pay for sex. I explained to them that Billy and I were lovers. I said I was having an affair and I just gave Billy money as a gift. It had nothing to do with sex. So you give him money every time you have sex? Asked the assistant district attorney. I think so, I said. Sounds like sex for money to me, he said. But since this is your first time, I will let you go easily. You will receive a fine of $500 and six months probation. See you in court in 10 days. Call someone to pay the bail. He left the room to confront another suspect. I had no choice. I called Evan. I told him where I was and that it was a big misunderstanding. Evan came to pick me up. When I was released, I was taken to a large room where the person posting the bail could pay the fine and then take you home. It was the worst moment of my life. Not only was Evan there, but the assistant district attorney told him about the case. My father was with Evan. Both looked at me with disgust. Then the worst happened. I saw Billy come out and a woman about my age walked up to him and slapped him. She looked at me and started laughing. Did you cheat on me with this? She laughed. Well, honey, he's all yours. I'm done with him. First thing tomorrow, I'll file for divorce. I hope you can take care of him. He never had a job the entire time we were together. She suddenly smiled. And then she said loudly to the officer at the counter, Oh my God, I was so upset that I forgot my wallet. Put him back in the cell, I'll be back soon. Then she started laughing again. Even I realized that she would not return. Apparently Billy understood too. He started screaming and begging her to come back. Elaine, I can't stand her. I only did it for the money, he shouted. She means nothing to me. Then we are getting divorced in vain, she said. This cop told me you too have been doing this for months. My father looked at me with disgust. Evan was much calmer. Evan, I'm so sorry, honey, I cried. I swear this will never happen again. As soon as we get home, I'll explain everything and... Carol, just save it for later when we talk, he said. He paid my bail and didn't say another word to me until we got home. He went to check on the children. They were fine. They were watching one of those Disney Christmas movies while their grandma slept on the couch. I'll put the kids to bed and... I began. I'll take care of it, he said. You don't have much time. Not much time for what? I asked. To pack, he said. 
You are going with your parents. We're done. What do you mean, are we done? I asked. He just left. I tried to call him every day, and he never picked up. My parents came to visit their grandchildren, and I was allowed to see them too, but even left the house during our visit. The day before the trial, I finally got to meet Evan. I put on the sexiest thing I owned, and I could tell by the way his eyes nearly popped out of their sockets that he still wanted me. Evan, honey, what do I need to do to convince you that I'm truly sorry? I asked. Carol, I believe you, he said. You don't have to do anything to convince me. Now let's move on to the divorce. I was shocked. I didn't want a divorce. I was sure that my parents forced him to do this. I ran out of the house. There was no way I would even discuss divorce. Apparently, this was all part of Evan's plan because he never tried to call me or anything again. The next day in court, I learned that in addition to the charges of providing paid sexual services, Evan was suing me for fraud. The judge essentially agreed with the assistant district attorney on the charges, but he also put me on the sex offenders list. I felt Evan's influence in this. I found myself divorced and penniless in less than three months. There is a law in our state that if you have committed a crime against your spouse, he can get a divorce almost immediately. The law was passed to help abused women, but Evan's lawyer used the rule like a virtuoso. He also used the fact that I was on the sex offender registry to get full custody of the children for Evan. My parents insisted that I find a job and a place to live. Over the next few months, I learned a lot piece by piece. I learned that Evan knew about what was happening long before my arrest. He hired a private investigator to follow me about a month before I got caught. Evan's private investigator gave an anonymous tip to the district attorney and secured my arrest. I also found out that someone beat Billy up. Evan was at a school program for one of our children at the time of the beating. Several witnesses saw him there. He attended the show with our children and his secretary, Iris. It seems like Evan has been spending a lot of time with Iris since our divorce. I never loved that bitch. She was always too passionate about my husband. I was sure that they would not last long. Evan had never been into thin, almost flat women. I was allowed to see my children once every two weeks. They seemed happy. In fact, I have never seen them so happy. I went a little crazy when I found out that Evan and Iris were engaged. I haven't been on a single date since breaking up with Evan. I tried different dating sites. I got a lot of first dates, but most of them ended prematurely. Even when I made it clear that I was ready for sex, many men did not agree. Iris and Evan seemed to rule the world. Evan forgot about me and moved on with his life. I became obsessed with getting my husband back. I decided the best way to do this was to get Iris to leave so we could make things right. I started following her and calling her constantly. This led to me being admitted to a psychiatric clinic. The good thing was that during the three years I spent there, they not only helped me realize that I would never get my husband back, but also taught me how to deal with my problems related to perceived neglect from my parents. The bad news was that when I came out, Evan and Iris had a child together. Everyone in the family, including my parents, doted on this boy, including his half-brother and sister. I will never get Evan back. Even my children were very tense and uncomfortable around me during our meetings. It seemed like they had their own lives that they wanted to go back to and I was no longer a part of those lives. Iris and I named our son Timothy Ivan after the two people who were most responsible for his birth. Ty looks like me, but also inherited his mother's height. He was so small that his older brother and sister called him Little Tim. Over time, we lost track of Carol. She simply disappeared from our lives. I heard rumors that she leads a very bad life. I never followed these rumors because I didn't care. Even the children didn't mention her anymore. In her own way, she truly became the ghost of Christmas past. The good thing is that the past is behind us, so Carol belongs there. I sincerely hope that she found some kind of happiness for herself, but I don't care anymore. I'm too busy with my wife and kids to let an unpleasant memory ruin everything. The day after Christmas, my beautiful Iris and I are heading off on yet another honeymoon. I believe this is our tenth. Ty will look after the business while we're gone. 
it took me a while to realize that it was Iris who made the wish for a happy life for me. She was in love with me for many years before she made this wish. Wherever they are, I hope Tim and Ivy got what they wanted too, because they gave me the best Christmas present ever. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.